Well, uh, I'm David Gustafson. I'm CTO for XIO here. And uh, it's going to take you through a little bit of uh, the whole Excelio product. First, I uh, want to start with the philosophy. Why did we do it? How did it end up the way it did and all that, right? Why is it different, if you will? We come from a storage background. And here we are not talking to you guys about an edge computing platform. Quite a different kind of conversation, right? So uh, if we start with, uh, first of all, why did build a different platform at all today. We talked about earlier commodity hardware. Commodity hardware is a good thing because, well, it drives a lot of volume, it drives down the cost, helps a lot of people, right? Um, the commoditization of hardware also drives a philosophy in architecture that we're going to talk about a little bit later on, around how you solve for very large problems by using commodity hardware. And there's trade-offs in those architectures that really um, make themselves known in footprint, node counts, power, cooling requirements, all the kind of stuff that happens when you start dealing with really large problems. So uh, it's, in essence, we saw an opportunity as we strategically saw unmet needs outside of the storage uh, area that we traditionally served. So as we started this project, um, the whole idea was really to build a next generation storage platform. Not surprisingly, right? We started this a long time ago, the next generation hardware. We look at it and say, hey, what are we going to build? What is our next architecture we're going to focus on? And these were really our design goals, right? Uh, breakthrough I.O. performance and storage capacity density, right? The more, the faster you can go with more density, the more you can provide to the consumers, right? It's pretty straightforward, be better in the storage side. But to do so, well, we look at technologies that have been addressed with proprietary means in the past. So you've seen a couple of our competitors that have gone down to generating their own flash modules. They go there down to managing the flash themselves. They do a very, very good job, but it becomes a proprietary stack, if you will. And you don't get the volumes and you don't get the scales of economy that you would if you use commodity off-the-shelf products. Right? So we didn't want to go down the same path and find in the same pitfall and saying, OK, we're going to make a monster box that can do awesome stuff. But because we build everything from the flash die up, it's going to be so costly, and we don't get the benefits of scale. So very, very important for us was, let's build something that takes advantage of the technologies that are available in the volume uh, uh, capabilities, if you will. Drives down the cost and allows for capabilities that uh, these proprietary architectures are otherwise trying to shoot for. So there's a couple of influences that drove why Axelio ended up the way it did. It started like a storage architecture philosophy. And so as we focused on that, we focused on the IO subsystem. But the IO subsystem is only a piece of the architectural needs once you start looking for a bigger who needs the stuff, right? And to us, while Bill explained the edge being you try to essentially put the application where the data is instead of the opposite. And that only happens once you have a certain size of data set, right? It's pretty straightforward. It's easier to move the application than the data, especially today with virtual machines. And uh, as you can do vMotions and all kinds of different things to just move the applications around, right? So from a technical perspective, this is probably the best way I know how to explain what we consider the edge. Move the application to the data, then the opposite. And to do that, well, you need to give its architecture enough for power to actually run the application as well, then, not just run you know, a low-level uh, storage uh, translation layer, if you will. Okay? So, as we look at the market then and say, okay, based on our abilities and what we can do here, and how the market consumes uh, system architectures, there's different types of problems that need different types of architectures. Not all problems are solved the same way, right? As we know in computer science, there's embarrassingly parallel problems, and there's inherently serial problems. And the difference between those two is really how much data dependencies do you have in the subtasks between those components, right? How much data has to be moved between the subtasks <clears throat> to collaborate to come up to a common outcome, right? And what we've seen lately has been a lot of scale-out architectures, very large scale-out architectures that has been very, very good at their certain things, right? So if you look at the different scale-out architectures out there, and scale is awesome. It solves really large problems. We talked about earlier, it's fast data or big data. Well, how do you fuse the two today? Well, you put them together in a very large scale-out architecture, right, with a very high-speed network to make this work. 
But if you look at the scale-out architectures that are out there, there are really <coughs> two classes, if you will. Either you build a scale-out architecture with or uh, or orchestration for applications, meaning the applications that run on the scale-out architecture, many of them fit inside the server. It's just that you have so many of them that it becomes a very, very hard problem to solve and architect and manage those applications. So a uh, virtual machine-oriented service provider is a great example. Well, all those virtual machines end up running on one machine, right? And then you have the alternative, which is a distributed computing problem, which is your problem is big enough that it doesn't fit on one system. Right? You've got to take the system application and slice it into subtasks. And those subtasks then become stripped and spread across nodes. Right? MapReduce is a great example on Hadoop, for instance, where in the end you shuffle the data to one arbiter that sends out the answer in the end. Right? And there's a lot of information that goes back and forth between these nodes. So depending on the problem you're trying to solve, you have an inherent data dependency in the ta task at hand. Right? And depending on which one you're then uh, architecting for today, well, you end up being uh, very much leaning on the network. The network becomes an intricate part of the compute, right? This is also where we're here. The network is the computer, right? It's because it becomes a larger set together. So what's the alternative to scale out? We all know that. It's scale up, right? What do you do? You get a bigger boat, right? You bigger, build a bigger system that can do more, and scale-up has gotten a bad reputation in the last few years in the market because incremental uh, growth and scaling is a very, very good thing to solve problems that have elastic needs, right? Especially if the application uh, pr predictability, how much are you going to need, is very hard to predict. Then it's good to buy in chunk size and then grow as you need it, right? Well, not all problems are that way. Some problems you know to solve it, you have to have a rack scale architecture just to get the throughput to the needs that you need to ingest, for instance, a certain amount of network ingest, right? So the three problems categories that fall into why does scale up work better? It really has to do with the nature of the problem. If it can't be sli uh, sliced into parallel tasks, inherently serial, you can't really slice it into that way. There are particular problems that are just data dependent in a serial fashion, right? Numerical methods, for instance, right? Uh, another famous one is the three-body problem, the sun, the earth, the moon, and how it moves and how they affect each other with gravity. They have a naturally serial-dependent problem, right? So some issues and how these new complex analytics that are being used today have similar type of issues. And then it comes down to where on that spectrum do you fall? Completely embarrassingly parallel to inherently serial you will have data interchange between the nodes. And the data interchange between nodes can be driven either by the fact that I need to access your data that you hold for me on the data side, or I'm shipping you stuff that are metadata or a result of something I computed, therefore you have to have my data. And all of a sudden, now the, the data goes on th onto the network, right? So this now means you start again leaning on the network. So what's happened in the last couple of years? Network has become incredibly competent. RDMA enabled, they go faster, they are very, very fast, right? And they are going down in price continuously and becoming more and more efficient. Turns out, network has a lot of wires, switching, components, chips, translation pieces and such. So if you look at that architecture, there might be a different way to take an approach to this. So in essence, we land in a conversation now where we've got to compare how do you interact and how do you move data? And if it's Ethernet, well, you have certain bounds, you have certain conditions, you have certain costs associated with it. If there's alternatives to move data that are cheaper, faster, and built in already, and you can take advantage of those, you now bring those value add forward that some people can take advantage of. So here we are, we are comparing an internal bus versus an external network. And these things, at first, and well, it makes no sense. Why are you comparing the two? They have very, very different architectural needs or what they are there for. And it's true. But the reason you spill outside of the box, so to speak, is because you can't do enough inside of the box. And the reality is the internal architectural buses in the system have a very, very different trans, uh, uh, transfer rate and the cost effectiveness as well. So if you look at that Xeon CPU today, coming off of the Intel line, every single one of them, even down to the lowest 2603 comes with 40 PCIe lanes, right? 40 PCIe lanes is essentially 40 gigabytes a second transfer rate 
half duplex, double that in full duplex, in a chip, for 200, what, 13 bucks? Try to get a NIC to do that, right? So what do you do normally in a scale-out architecture? You then take a NIC and you slap it into one of those slots, and then you extend that network over to a switch. You take that switch and then you extend it to another card and it goes into another CPU. Well, there you go. Now you have the translation chain in the Ethernet. And so now, if you can do that cheaper, faster, why not, right? So the challenge with PCIe, though, is that it's an internal bus. And being it, it's an internal bus, you know the spec or the guidelines of routing for the traces, no longer than 20 inches, for instance, right? This is a high-speed signal architecture that, uh, uh, let's say it this way, it can be very tricky to get right at large scales. We have some experience with it. And, uh, but if you can make that work and you can use that bus, you can really move a lot of data for very little extra cost in a completely different realm that we're just seeing network scale-out architectures, right? So it's not that we don't believe that scale-out is you know, good. Scale-out is awesome to solve very large problems. But if you can solve more in the node, more efficiently, that just helps you a lot better, right? And this goes back to the ever persistent system integration and put more stuff in a smaller package because the more of that you do, the more efficient you can solve the problem, right? So we believe in scaling up. We call it scaling in, in the box, right? Scale in before you scale out. Uh, and size the nodes that you're trying to use appropriately for the problem you're trying to solve for, right? Just all using one U or two U pizza boxes with, you know, eight core CPUs, 64 gig of RAM or whatever you do, because the reality is if you don't have enough of IO capability in that box, having more CPU and memory in that box doesn't help you anything because you're IO bound now. So when you're sitting there being IO bound, having more cores in the same box, all you're doing is sitting around doing nothing. So it's a lot of waste of time, which is also why you see a lot of the scale-out architecture is using very modest type of hardware, right? So um, where did that lead us? Well, take all these things in combination. Storage company coming at uh, a new platform with new technology capabilities. Uh, we're looking at the edge and what the edge means as uh, what do we need to do to run both the application as well enabling then this IO capability? And how do we build that in a way that is cost effective and takes advantage of the technologies in the market such that we get a, you know, a, a platform that doesn't cost itself out of being useful, if you will, right? So clearly, we started about three years ago in this architecture, believe it or not. Um, three years ago, uh, this was before dual ported NVMe SSDs were available. At that point, everybody was going from six gig to 12 gig in SAS, right? We looked at 12 gig SAS and says, yeah, we can go there too. Reality is we're just gonna be another me too on that side, so hey, you know, what else can, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We had really uh, dug in on the NVMe side and recognized the strength of the protocol benefits. And uh, so we started with the system architecture uh, to build a large scale NVMe architecture essentially. And then uh, work with some of the SSD vendors out there to make it a dual ported capability. And the dual portedness is of course important for high availability and for other reasons that uh, we are used to in the SaaS enterprise side, right? Uh, we used to build our own motherboards. Um, and those motherboards were, I would call them uh, modest in complexity. They were not the complexity that you see in a traditional dual socket, Xeon, full-fledged server architecture, right? And the reason we didn't do that was because frankly our software in storage didn't need it. Like Gavin was referring to earlier, we took the SBC1 price performance when we announced our all flash on a very modest hardware platform because, well, that's what we kind of focus on, getting a lot of performance out of a small package. So we decided to go with the off-the-shelf component approach again, right? So this is actually just leveraging Intel Xeon motherboards off the shelf. We packaged that then with 72 dual-ported NVMEs. And, um, when we started talking to the SSD vendors around this, because the guys who were working on NVMe at the time saw the NVMe drive being the absolutely upper echelon of performance of SSD capability, right? And why would you ever put 72 NVMe SSDs in one box? That's crazy. By the way, they're rated at 25 watts a piece, right? So do the math. 
it adds up quite a bit, right? The funny part about that is we actually started with 96 NVMe drives in the box. Ran the power, ran the cooling, got the whole thing designed for power and cooling perspective, everything, right? Just turns out that when you have that many in a 2U system, the box stuck out the rack. No. So, <laughs> well, it's, uh, right. we could cool, power it, no problem. Actually, that, we don't have a problem with that at all. Cool the neighborhood browned out, they said stop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me say it this way. If you would take a rack full of these, uh, you will probably have to th rethink your power distribution in, in the data center. What we're seeing is between two and a half up to three kilowatt. Okay? Now, that depends on load, how many drives you put into it, and what you load, what you're configuring the servers and such like that, right? So, while that sounds like a really big number, you've got to compare that then to an alternative architecture to solve the same problem. And what we see there is there were drastically more uh, uh, power uh, uh, efficient, right? Because, well, we don't need all this scale out stuff. So essentially what happens is, well, you do it internal to the bus, and yes, while you add a few watts into the box, you get a lot more work done. So um, another key point, so we design this box, we put it together, put it in the lab, start working the stuff. We start talking to new breed of customers, right? Like we have had a very, uh, in-phase dialogue with a lot of enterprise direct customers using our eyes, that's a storage consumer. And here we are showing something very, very different, and we have a very different dialogue. Right? And what became evident is that, well, yeah, by the way, can you put uh, NVIDIA GPU in there? Because if you can, I can use my GPU accelerated database on top of this huge data set with a tremendous IO throughput. And by the way, I have a problem feeding my GPUs with enough data today because I gotta go over to a SAN and try to ingest it over the wire to feed my GPU, and I just can't keep it busy enough. All of a sudden, here we are now, we have that much data transfer inside of the box and be able to feed the GPU. So it became evident to us very quickly that, okay, everybody has a different idea on how they're gonna use this box. And what we thought people were gonna use it for, well, clearly, there's a lot more to it than that. So modularity in architectures so we can uh, accommodate for different needs became very, very important, right? You need to do ether, Ethereum uh, bit, bit mining. What, what's it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's, that's mostly CPU. Maybe we can do a GPU offload. Oh, no, it's CPU. It's, GPU it's, based it's low end. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That, that, that would be an interesting use case. We should talk after. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and another point of this, right, is, okay, it's great. You have this phenomenal IO capability inside of the box. But if you can't get the data in or out of the box, then what good is it? Right? How many boxes have, you know, actually generates its own data internally? Well, not very many, right? So the point was to, of course, to allow for an I.O. path in and out of the box that also serves them incredibly well for scale-out architectures. So it's not limited to be just this scale-up system that can't do anything else, right? So here's where we landed. Uh, technical specifications on this, right? So a 2U box, the box has, not surprisingly, two servers inside of it, right? The two servers carries two CPUs per. We can go the entire spectrum of the 2600 Broadwell architecture up to 2699, which contains 22 cores per CPU. Multiply it by four, you get 88 cores or 176 logical uh, cores, if you will, right? Um, we built it for, of course. I'm sorry, four sockets per two sockets node? Per, two, two, two sockets, sockets per, per node, four yep. sockets per system. Okay, Correct. I got it. Uh, up to two terabytes of RAM. Uh, we have ability to add NVDIMs in the RAM should we need to for uh, fast non-volatile uh, metadata should be needed, used by sophisticated uh, system software sometimes. Um, and then the NVMe storage underpinnings, right? So we do up to 72, two and a half inch NVMe SSDs. Now it's important there to understand that while the scale has the capability to go to 72, we can scale to any number in between. And we can scale deep or we can scale wide on that bus in the back end depending on your capacity versus performance needs, right? So you don't have to start at half a petabyte to play in this game, right? You might start at, frankly, a couple of petab oh, terabytes and then start growing with it as you need it, right? Uh, some of the performance numbers you see here are... Uh, so it's a multi-tiered structure. You've got NVMe flash and NVMe SSDs, is that... Mm -mm. So it's all based on uh, the whole U.2 NVMe form factor. So two and a half inch standard form factor. 
which means I can go and find whatever's available in the market, plug them in there just like slots would be in a normal server, right? And that's the whole, a lot of the cost in this architecture is CPU, memory, and MME flash. That's really it. And all of them are commodity high volume parts, right? So we can drive down the bomb cost of the entire system. Yes, we have some uh, uh, circuitry and system components, but essentially that's boards, PCBs, right? They're routing the PCI architecture and how that puts together. The vast majority of the cost sits in all these other components. And that's how we then can keep our costs down and be competitive to, frankly, anybody else that would choose to try to do the same thing, okay? Of that 460 gig of NVMe flash, how much is that is actually usable in your system? Then? So this is, uh, it says 460 gig, 460 terabytes is what oh, it's yeah, supposed terabytes. to be. <laughs> 460 <laughs> terabytes. Uh, uh, it's all usable. Depending on how you use it then, it'll translate to the software layer as consumable capacity of different kinds, right? So this is raw. This is the raw capacity that is at the lowest layer, right? So when you then boot a Linux kernel on top of this thing, all those devices show, shows up as slash dev slash NVMe and one, two, three, four, all those devices. You can then choose to consume those devices in many different ways to create a different layer of capacity utilization, right? So it becomes uh, uh, how much usable capacity do you end up with? Well, it depends on your software stack, right? And that's also where you see us working with system integrators to take advantage of the system because the reality is most of them come with their own software package and they want to consume things the way they want to consume things, okay? So uh, you can see some of the performance numbers being measured, over 12, 12 million IOPS, that's a single uh, sector transfer, so arguably useful, uh, as low as 35 microsecond latency. That, I can tell you, changes things. And you're measuring that from the CPU inside the controller yep. to the storage and back, you're not actually measuring it across the network or anything like that. The application running to access I.O., right? So right. the traditional storage latency. That you would, right. because the application is not running inside of the box, right? So it accesses the storage straight inside. Uh, I'm sorry. You measured that where? At the application layer inside of the uh, system. So the oh, inside the Excelio, Excelio right. box, right? So the, the application is loaded inside of the yes, system. Yes, yes, yep. yes. And then exactly right. So, so what's the networking? Uh, you have networking here, but I don't see the specs on the network. Yep, uh, we can go into that. I have that in the next slide okay. set, so we can go into that's that. Fine. But it's a good question. Uh, the optional offload modules here is uh, Intel Phi, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, different kinds uh, for different needs, right? Those are, so essentially uh, what we do, since this is PCIe uh, architecture, is that we can translate these uh, NVMe modules into essentially PCIe modules that you just attached and use as what would be a PCIe socket if, eventually. Okay? So this was kind of the, how we... Are the, are the um, NVMe SSDs hot pluggable? Not in this architecture. We're working on that right now. This is a, a carry forward of integrating deeper, right? So this is a SSD carrier, if you will, right? Uh, what we're seeing is we had some, some conversations with solution vendors is, yeah, they absolutely are looking for hot pluggable pieces. So that's, that's exactly what's on the design table right now. Okay? And so how do, you, how do you then account for failure in the system then when you start to lose these over time? Great question. So as you start losing these over time, first of all, our experience with SSDs today is very, very, very different than what hard drives used to be. They don't fail to nowhere close to the same degree. And what we're finding with this customer need they don't even want RAID. Once you have a big enough data set and you're solving a problem enough, big enough, then what happens is, in their mind, because they are pushing the system as fast and as hard as they can, that's the only reason you're looking at a solution like this, is that any of that stuff just slows it down. And frankly, what's more important to me is to get the insight than it is to make sure that I cover for this, you know, very, very few occasions where something doesn't work right, right? So, while we are used in high availability storage enterprise requirements, and of course you have to have data protection, you have to have all these stuff. Well, this is a very different marketplace. It's a very different thing. Essentially, right, what we're competing against here is a memory. Off the shelf server with a crap load of memory shoved into it, and they're trying their best to keep the work set in memory. And many times do they fail, so they spill, and as soon as they spill out of memory, they get slowed down an order of magnitude or more because the IO subsystem is so slow. 
right? So it's a very different requirement set. So is it, the, is it basically operating where they're basically like sharding the data set across all the disks separately and then just one dies away from maintenance window to replace it? You could do that. And uh, what we're finding in a lot of the streaming analytics pieces is uh, they put a file system on top of it and in different folders and you just mount the drives and create the pieces and the file system just writes them flat. So well, you it, know, it, yeah. If you're competing with memory in this environment, let's say, a 35 microsecond latency is pretty Oh, that, that's, that's orders of so magnitude yeah, higher yeah, than memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, yeah. do you find that customers are willing to, to deal with? Well, so that's why you also have the ability to go to the memory that you need in this architecture, right? right? So you have two terabytes of RAM in this. So we're not saying don't use memory. It's just that when you grow outside of memory, which you will inevitably do if you do a complex analytics, right, and large data sets, when you do, don't be bound by an old single SSD or hard drives in the system, right? If you can feed memory at these type of rates, it changes how the whole solution has to come together because a lot of the scale out then is, okay, let's keep everything in memory, right, and short it out. And if it's an embarrassing parallel problem, that works really well. Some of them are not, right? So this is, uh, I'm not saying this is going to take over every scale out architecture. By no means, we are not trying to solve uh, General purpose. High hyper-converged scale-out problem being a general purpose VDI scale-out problem, right? Talk about embarrassingly parallel. Everybody has their own desktop, and you can run how many on each node, and you just add another one you need to, and the cross-communication between the two, well, that's usually on the data set because of the distributed file system sits underneath that hyper-converged architecture, right? In this architecture, you... Uh, Everything is internal. Everything is needed to, uh, if you need to get to data at large speeds and large masses, it's right there at the fingertip. So the trick is, if the data set overflows RAM, I can have half a petabyte. That's right. Traditionally, instead of having 35 microseconds, I'd be lucky milliseconds if I had to start even on a good, well-designed, scaled system. Yep. So. And in some of those scenarios, right, there's very, very smart algorithms in what you keep in memory versus what you keep on disk, which means the philosophy there is, the way we have done that in the past is what? Large transfers, sequential, because that's how you get high transfer rates. Why do we do that? Well, because the drive can either read fast in sequential or write fast in sequential. If you do both at the same time, what happens? It falls off the cliff, right? Because now you have a contention point. So a lot of software out there too have not taken into consideration the fact that you actually have now completely bi-directional capability in this data pool where you can read it as fast as you can write it, and at the same time. And this is where you see this new breed of solutions start cropping up regarding real-time analytics while ingesting. While before, a lot of the packet capture architecture was essentially find a way to peel off all the packets off the Ethernet wire without losing a packet. So if you look at the architectural uh, focus on a lot of those companies today, what they did was build a NIC. And they have a NIC that has an internal buffer on it so they can peel off the packets and then destage out of that buffer into memory, right? So essentially the problem was, how do we get it off the wire? Well, now when they can't get it off the wire fast enough, now it's a matter of getting in, into disk. And now once it's in the disk, how do you make something useful out of it? So now the next cycle here is elevate the, your, your, your stack to do analytics on top of the same data set. Seems to me this would be a perfect use case for some 3D memory once that really becomes a viable nice product. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. Exactly. There's absolutely, uh, <coughs> what this does, it is radically changes the IO, CPU, memory balance. It changes how you think about how you solve problems. Because essentially what we've done is eliminated the IO bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And the IO bottleneck many, many times in the architecture drives why it looks the way it does. Okay? Up until this point, a Hadoop architecture took a number of different devices, a number of different storage plays, uh, and compute elements. Seems like you're putting an entire Hadoop architecture in one 2U rack. So, Hadoop, MapReduce. You have a large data set, and then you keep it on many, many nodes. You need to traverse the entire data set to get some insights out of that data, which essentially then becomes, how fast can I read that data set? So what do we do? We take a set of drives and put them in a node. We take another drive set and we put it in a node. And you know, with today's server architecture, depending on what drives you put in there, you'll end up where somewhere probably between one or two gigabytes a second read capability in that system, right? Well, this gives you 30 times that. Right. So it is definitely 
a tool to be used deliberately to solve problems that today scale out problems are solving, just not necessarily elegant. Okay? And I think that that kind of concludes the introduction and why we ended up with what we did. Okay?